ಹಾಗಾದ್ರೆ right now okay so right now we're going to talk this is uh this is another on the road with our buddy Shane Wilson from scaletrains.com and right now as far as i understand he's on interstate 72 uh driving west towards Hannibal uh Kansas and he's actually talking to us while he's on the road is that correct Shane <laughs> sure it is Lionel <laughs> you doing about uh what do you do pulling that uh that puppy what is that? it looks good that re all red uh, truck wow, wow what are you doing what's your cruising speed usually hanging around 70 um you know trailer tires are rated at 75 and gas mileage the faster you go boy it sinks like a rock so usually sometimes somewhere between 65 and 70 okay so you make decent time like that yeah it's not too bad so we're not really and you get used to being passed all the time <laughs> yeah <laughs> bet <laughs> it'd be it'd be worse when the transport trucks are passing you oh man i'm telling you sometimes it it can be a, a pretty hairy ride so you're not really on interstate 72 are you no no we're back home after the third road trip so that way we're safe when we're uh you know chatting don't yeah. want to be the distracted driver yeah okay um oh how much time do we have today because i have something else i'd like to record after we finish with this job not For you, Lionel, we've got all day. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so, okay. So, the last time we talked was before you had even started on your road trips. It was before you even, I think, even before you got the RV wrapped and everything. And now you've got, you've been on three road trips. Mm -hmm. We got all screwed up trying to connect somehow. I don't know. I lost your cell phone number for some reason or other. And I, I was trying, and I, I was, I was emailing you and somehow we just weren't connecting somehow. And I'm much more of a texting guy. Like, when I don't want to stay in contact with people, like, if you text me, boom, like, it's in my pocket. There I am. Okay, hey. And you can, it's much easier to, so I suggest that we exchange uh, cell phone numbers again, assuming you don't mind getting, you know, having me constantly text you, you know, hey, <laughs> hey, today I'm going over to, today I'm getting my car washed and stuff like that. No, I don't mind at all. All right. <clears throat> you know, this, this has actually been one of the big challenges of the road trip and is, you know, the first two, we certainly didn't allow enough time to stay caught up with the office. And on the third trip, we we budgeted more time in to be able to do that. But the, one of the reasons I've relied on email so much is I'm really checking messages at weird hours, you know, midnight, 5 a.m., stuff like that. So uh, because during the day, we're just on the go constantly. Some of the first uh, dates, I'd get started at 5 in the morning and get back um to to the rv maybe 11 12 o'clock at night so Holy man. uh yeah it, it it was a it was an eye-opening experience but it's been a lot of fun it's just a lot of work and i think now we're kind of figuring it out right i mean we now it's like if we're going to travel we'll travel one day uh get to the destination spend the next day catching up on work and then that night we'll do the meet and greet in that city and travel the following day so it's giving us more time because you know, this is like an add-on. This isn't like this isn't my full-time job or my wife's full-time job. You know, I still got to run a company to run, and she's still got an office to run. So you have to make sure you're keeping up with the folks back home in Tennessee. Well, exactly. That's like uh, you know, I have my place in Florida, but I can never manage to be there more than two weeks at a time because I always start getting nervous, and they don't really need me back at my office. But I always come home for <laughs> ten days or so just to. And I've yeah, started. they're already asking us when when I'm leaving again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's what they just. <laughs> that's what you'll discover. But uh, okay, so yeah, like it sounds like you need a more relaxed pace. I think it's that's like, the hard part. It's not like everything in life. You have all these grand plans. It's like building a layout or whatever, and you end up have all these grand plans. And in your head, you're thinking, okay, it's going to take me a couple hours to do this, and a few days, and we'll get or two to do that, and blah blah blah. And you get halfway through, and you're thinking, no. Nope. No, it's not quite that easy. Everything always takes more time than you expect. I mean, it's whether you're doing a little project around the house or anything, it just it just seems like it's always harder than than you expected it was going to be. 
But I would say by following along on Facebook, it looks to me like so far the thing's been a roaring success. It's been beyond our wildest dreams, even in just these first three trips. You know, we've we've already logged, believe it or not, over 10,000 miles on the truck. And, uh, you know, we've we've now been to, uh, gosh, I think we're at uh, 13 states. We've been uh, 10 of those we've done events in. And it has been unbelievable. We've had meet and greets in big cities, in small rural towns. We've had people drive crazy distances to come see us, which blows me away. And we've also had chances to rail fan and do some photography and document real um, trains. And we've we've uh, visited some private layouts, which just would blow your mind. And and uh, probably the cool one of the coolest things is, you know, the truck, as you mentioned in the trailer, they're wrapped and they've got the company colors and, and the road trip logos and all those things on them. And every single place we stop for the night, there is at least somebody that comes up and tells us a story about someone that they know, an uncle, a friend, a grandparent, somebody who either worked for the real railroad or had a model railroad. And it's it's a lot of fun. And you can tell as they recount their memories that it really brings back some fond uh, memories for them. And and uh, it's kind of neat, kind of make that connection no matter where you are. Yeah, that would be cool. I mean, that's that's kind of really why I remember when we talked before. Like you weren't a hundred percent sure this was a great idea, and I kept thinking to myself, "This is a no brainer as far as I was concerned." <laughs> and and uh, I mean, I kind of expected. That's why I suggested that as we go along, we needed to, as regularly as we could, get together and tell you know put it out there so that the folks could hear it. Because I, I'm not surprised. Like we've only been talking for seven minutes here, and I'm not surprised. I can tell we got tons of stuff to talk about because I'm not surprised. That when you, like you say, when you park, people are constantly coming up to you to tell you stories about about either family members who were real railroaders or or about their, you know, family members that were model railroaders. I just think this, I caught you, you know, I know you listen to every podcast and some of them twice, but I constantly say this hobby is way bigger than anybody realizes. I totally agree. You know, the very first day out, we left from here in Tennessee and we drove up um, just outside of Cincinnati, Ohio, and we're stopping for dinner and uh of course got to have some good old skyline chili when you're in cincinnati and my wife's like no way i'm having that but i went and got mine and i came back and our dog is traveling with us bear and i take bear um on a little walk while my wife goes and gets her dinner and and while i'm standing with the dog and i'm looking back towards the rv i noticed that this vehicle this suv pulls up behind the trailer and i can see they're looking all over the trailer and as i walk back a dad and his two young sons get out they're probably i don't know 10, 12 years old. And, uh, and they start to tell me the story of how dad inherited his, his dad's trains. And, and they had all these Tyco trains back in the seventies and the eighties and how much fun it was. And the boys had saw the trailer and they asked, they wanted to stop and they checked out our website had never heard of us. And, and, uh, they've always wanted to get their trains out. You know, they wanted their dad to get the trains out. Well, that was their inspiration. The next week we get a message from them and, and they've gotten their grandpa's trains out and they started setting them up and, and they're playing with grandpa's trains. And it's like, man, that is so cool that we could inspire someone to do that. Yeah. And I think that's really what the, the road trip's all about. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, it's like when people say that it's, they're inspired by something on the podcast. It just gives you a feeling of, wow, what I'm doing is important. I can't. You know, and that's that's one thing, too, that, uh, Lana, we met some folks along the way. I always joke that, you know, it's model trains. It's not life and death. But honestly, for some people, it is. Um, I won't call out a name, but uh, there was a person in um, Louisville, Kentucky, uh, that we that we spent some time with. And my wife answers are all pretty much she's responsible for our sales mailbox. So she answers a lot of emails. She knows a lot of folks by name. And she recognized this young gentleman. And he had um, he had an accident that caused some pretty serious brain damage. And he he really struggles with depression and and is really challenged by it. And he talks about how um, he loves our product and and he it can't believe the detail. And and when he has those bouts of depression, he gets his his scale trains out and he runs them, and it brings him such joy and it really helps him get out of that funk. And and you know it's 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 humbling. It's um it's almost you know it's it touches your heart to think that you can have a, an effect. Uh, on a person's life like that. And, you know, we met another uh, young lad in Oklahoma City. Um, 
who, uh, and I can't remember the exact story. Michelle would know it for sure. But in his youth, he, they didn't think he would ever walk, talk, all of those things. And his dad worked with him and, and model trains was kind of their thing. And, and, uh, this, he has, he can, he has a little challenge with his speech, but he asks great questions. And, and the, this young lad, he can sing. Holy smokes. Can he sing and bring a tear to your eye. And he loves his scale trains. And it's one of those things that he and his dad have connected with. And it's really helped him from a therapeutical standpoint. And, 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 you know, that, that to me is just amazing that in our hobby and in our industry, the thing that we have the most passion for can have such a, a positive impact on somebody's life. Yeah. And when somebody tells you a story like that, like somebody is struggling and, and the trains or what it, it's somebody is struggling and something you're doing is helping them get through the day. It almost gives you, it, it, for me, it makes me feel like I have this responsibility to make sure I do as good a job with the podcast as I possibly can. Cause I've had the same kind of conversations and emails from people that you describe and you're thinking, man, I got to do this and I got to do it right. And I'd probably send you off to the next day kind of going, I got to keep going here. You know? It absolutely does. You know, and, and, and it's those things that, that I, that I share with our team because you know, a lot of times for product support or sometimes in sales, you only hear the negative. Somebody has got a problem with their train or um, an order, something happened with their order and they're frustrated and you hear a lot of negative and it's just the nature of the beast. A lot of folks don't call you up to share the positive and to be able to hear these things and, and share it with our team. It's like, guys, we make a difference. What we do matters to people and we have to do this to the best of our abilities every single day and everything that we do. And, and, I, and that's what inspires us to create the best models that we possibly can. Yeah, it really is. Uh, it really is. It, it's, now that you're getting out there and amongst the people, and I know I know you always have, but really pretty much up until this situation, it's always been in these big show atmospheres where you're talking to 100 people at the same time <clears> or people are constantly wanting to talk to you and it, it doesn't give you the chance to concentrate. And that's probably, I'm guessing, one of the things you've found is it gave you more intimate one-on-one -on -one kind of situations on a more regular basis. You know, like I understand you went... You were doing show and you know you were doing show and tells to uh, groups, but uh, like you've already relayed stories of individual contact that's made a difference for you. Well, you know that that's the the beauty of the road trip. We we always wanted to be you know we don't want to we don't ever want to be a nameless faceless corporation. Um, we want to be that that company that that you feel like is your best friend that you can come up and talk to us at a show an event wherever we might be and, and, and just have a conversation like we're old friends, just like you and I are having right now, because it, the one thing about our hobby is, is social. And, and while social media helps that it's that one-on-one -on -one in person contact that that's really where it's at. And it's, it's amazing to, to share the story. You know, we, when we do a meet and greet, we, we share how we got started, which is nothing short of a miracle. And you know, that story, Lionel, and, and we, we talk about, um, we show some video about how model trains are made and, and we answer questions and, and I'm not afraid to tell folks the real story. It might not be what you want to hear, but I'll give you the real answer, the most honest answer I can give. And, and I think people respect that. Uh, and I've seen, I've had some people ask some questions. I think they thought I would get upset with. And it's like, I'm, I'll answer it. It doesn't bother me. Why, you know, anything from why do you make model trains in China to why do you do such and such cost so much to why do you make that model or you know, you name it. And, and that's where it makes it real. And that's where you make those connections. Because the one thing about it is as, as you get out there and you meet people, you make lifelong advocates for your brand. You know, you're making brand ambassadors. It's, it's inspirational. I, I, this has been just one of the most amazing things we've ever done in our life. My wife and I, it's, it's helped us get closer to each other. Um, we're traveling with our dog, which has been a lot of fun. And and just meeting people, you know, we, and, and we've had some great, we've had a lot of fun along the way. We've got to do some things that we wouldn't normally get to do. We've taken some breaks for a little bit, you know, an afternoon or an evening or, and, uh, and got to see, you know, the United States is a beautiful country and there's so many great people. And, you know, it's one thing when you fly from place to place, I've flown to Oklahoma city and, and like Phoenix, Arizona and LA and all those places. But when you actually do it by ground and you're connecting those dots and you're seeing um, this country and and it's amazing that how much it changes whether you're in the plain states or the mountains or 
uh, on the coast of California or somewhere in, in nowhere, Texas, you know, you know, we're driving along I-10 there in, in, uh, you can look over and, and there's the border wall with Mexico and you can see Mexico on the other side. And, um, I don't know that that's one of the, I think most rewarding parts too, is just seeing different places. Like you've barely started. And this is the second time we've talked about it. And it sounds like it is nothing but just a roaring success. It's been a, it's been amazing. You know, we, some of the things we've got to do, you know, we've done a lot of meet and greets. Um, now I think we've done something like 19 meet and greets in 10 States. We did the river and rail festival in, um, uh, Fort Madison, Iowa did that with the virtual rail fan, the Kingsley in there and uh, got to be on the BNSF Transcon. That was really cool. But one of the neat things that happened there is uh, we got invited over to Eldon, Iowa, to the Eldon Depot, which is in uh, crazy rural Iowa. And this um, little depot, they used to be rail served uh, by two railroads across there. There's no rail service anymore, but they've got a museum and there's a there's a Topeka cab outside and a flat car and a caboose. And along the old right away, they made this path that leads out to the river. And the museum itself is one of the most amazing railroad museums I've ever seen. And everything has got signs that tells you what you're looking at, whether it's a tool or some piece of artifact. And uh, it was really educational. And then they've got another building where uh, there's a big model railroad layout and, and there's lots of uh, 10 plate trains, you know, old uh, three rail trains and things like that. And, and we would have never visited Eldon, Iowa, had we not been to Fort Madison. And uh, a grave site. If, if you're, you know, if somebody's traveling through Iowa and has got a little chance to get off I-80 and take a little detour, well worth the stop. You know, another place we went to, uh, we got invited to a private layout in Cornville, Arizona, which is about 20 minutes south of Sedona. And this uh, gentleman has built a, uh, I'll call it like a warehouse, a, a big metal building in this town. And he's all, and inside of it's a railroad. And then in um, next door, he's got a, uh, the workshop, and he's modeling the um, Union Pacific from Cheyenne to Ogden, Utah, and recreating it scene by scene. And it's one of the most amazing model railroads I've ever seen. And the club layouts, even that we're seeing, and the people that we're meeting at clubs, and um, you know, we got to do some rail fanning at fl- near Flagstaff. And I shot, gosh, I'll bet I shot three thousand photos. And there's several like fifty-three foot containers that we haven't done that we need to do. And, we caught like the BNSF, a couple of BNSF 25th anniversary units. And then when I got to Southern California, Mike and I went out and rail fan in the desert for a day. So uh, there's so many incredible things that are happening. And we're just, and the amazing thing <laughs> is, as you said, we're just getting started. Yeah. And you can't, you can't hardly take it all in. Like that layout you're talking about in Cornville, uh, Arizona is, uh, it's like a secret almost. Mm-hmm. I mean, were you even aware of it before you got there? Um. They had they had sent us an invitation. They saw that we were going to be in Flagstaff and in Phoenix, and they're like, "Well, while you're passing through, if you get a right. chance, come see us." And so we set that up beforehand. And and uh, but before and before went, before they contacted you, did you even know it existed? I had no idea. Yeah, no idea. I know. And and there's been other private railroads that have contacted us that we'll get a chance. And the cool thing too is, you know, they're all allowing us to shoot video and photography. And and over the next several weeks, we'll be posting little snippets. Um, you know, of each place that we went to, to kind of share so people can see, you know, we went to a club in, in, uh, Phoenix that had our, uh, this roundhouse and there's five guys, this, you know, we, you and I talk about this a lot. There's five guys under the age of 26 who have, golly, they probably had 30 BNSF and other locomotives around this turntable. And then we had the, that was the first stop where we actually had the 25th anniversary unit. So we put that on the turntable and we take these, this, these, um, videos and photos and it's just incredible these guys have all these scale trains locomotives and they're under 26 years old and they are super passionate um and i think that's something too that really excites me is er- just about everywhere we've been um there's youth and and they're really involved you know the couple of guys that we met in uh young guys in in uh, Pekin, illinois just outside of peoria crazy passionate about model trains and uh and a lot of other places that we've gone to too so you know, I, I, I read a lot of doom and gloom we, um, about the hobby, but I tell you, I don't believe it for a second. No, that, that is long gone. I was uh, talking to John Sacerdote there a few weeks ago, and I had said to him, you know, I forget who, I forget where, where I was on some podcast and we were talking and somebody was talking to doom and gloom. And I said, you know what? I don't want to talk about that anymore, because as far as I can tell from everything, everything I've learned from this podcast is 
model railroading is younger than you think. Period. End of sentence. Like that. 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 That is an old discussion that I don't think even warrants a mention anymore because I think this hobby is way younger than people realize. I think the main reason is because all of these young people now, and when I say young, I'm saying under the age of 35 or 40 because, and there's got tons of guys in their 20s, but they're finding each other. Whereas before right. they were isolated and now they're finding each other. I think there's this huge tsunami of a wave coming of, of uh, that generation that's just going to change the hobby again because they will have had so much involvement and been immersed in the hobby for so long with so many people. It's going to change the hobby again. I don't think we can even imagine. Like you say, these guys, the Arizona Model Railroading Society, it's I think the one you're talking about where the guys had all the, all mm-hmm, the That's the one, yep. Yeah, I yep. see the picture on your Facebook page here and it's like, that's un- like what a spectacular scene that is with all those locomotives. And you, oh, and, I tell you, and this club is it's like a bunch of young guys. You said, um, the club is 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 all ages, but the the all the trains that you see around that turntable, there's five guys under the age of twenty six. Wow, that's just unbelievable. Yeah, it is. It is, it, it, and I don't care. You know, I don't care how often I say it or anything, but it is. It's unbelievable to think that this is happening in our hobby. And to, I mean, I just, I think this road trip is just a spectacular idea. And I'm excited now here talking to you for the first time since you've been on the road. I mean, it sounds like it's just this crazy success that you couldn't even have imagined by the sounds of it. Well, you know, and the other thing too, when when you and I talked the last time, one of the things that we were hoping for is that we could share our favorite hobby as well as our business outside of the traditional channels. And we've we've been really blessed. We do press releases to all of the local media for every city that we go to. And from coast to coast, we've been on TV news. We've been on radio live broadcasts. We've uh, been published in newspapers, both online and in print. There's been um, – we've been featured on travel channels, uh, like local um, tourism uh and so it's an opportunity to get that messaging out beyond our hobby and even having it on the truck and the trailers, getting that message out no matter where we go. So hopefully um, not only does it grow our business, but it expands our hobby too. And I'm assuming every time somebody sees a modeler's life on the back, they come running up to you and say, have you ever been do on Do you know that? Lionel Strang? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So let's uh, do a quick recap. So what was the first trip to? Um, first trip. Um, so the first two trips, actually, we did what we called shakedown trips. We want to do short trips when you're towing an RV, you know, there's always these little gremlins that pop up and you got a lot to learn. So, um, the first trip we went up to, uh, central Illinois started at with the club that I belong to as a, as a youth in my teens. And, and, uh, that's in Rossville, Illinois. That's a Danville junction chapter. And, uh, of course that's a little bit off the beaten path. And then um, then we took the opportunity, went down to St. Louis and chased the big boy. And that was a ton of fun. Uh, we learned that the big boy that we acquired from MTH isn't quite accurate. So we'll be going to Cheyenne in the spring and, uh, making some pretty significant tooling changes to make sure 4014 is accurate. Uh, so that's something that we learned. And then we went to a little tiny place called Crawford County, uh, model railroad club in Robinson, Illinois. That's down near where my grandparents lived when I was a young boy down in Florida, Illinois. And, and, uh, that's, um, actually, you know, it was amazing. I think we probably had 25, 30 people that night. And then we went back over towards St. Louis and, and, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We did, um, St. Louis before that we did the St. Charles club. And then we went to Springfield, Illinois and, and then, uh, actually documented a real locomotive on the way home from Illinois back to Tennessee. Um, one that we'll probably bring out in a couple of years, uh, but there's only like three left in the real world. So we knew we had to get it while we had the opportunity. So that was the first trip, and uh, and that one lasted about 10 days or so. And then uh, we were home just a couple of weeks, and then we went back out. Uh, we went to the River and Rail Festival I mentioned earlier now, in Fort it, Madison. Fort Madison, Illinois. Iowa. Iowa. And what was uh, that? Iowa. Yep, was, right across. Was, was it a spectacular? It's, it sounded cool when you said it. Like, was it as cool I, as you thought it was going to be? Um. I would, the event itself was really cool. The attendance was probably not quite what we expected. Okay. Uh, we thought it would be a bit higher. We, we were expecting more of a festival event, but uh, right. it turned out to be good. You know, we, there, it's right there on the BNSF Transcon, right on the river, yeah. Mississippi River. And uh, I shot, I probably shot 1,500 photos or more <laughs> that weekend. So, uh, and, 
you know, and so we visited too. We visited clubs. We mentioned that club in Pekin outside of Peoria. And then we also did uh, the Division 8, the K&I Model Railroad Club in Louisville, Kentucky. And then we did uh, the Hawkeye Club just outside of Iowa City. Uh, went to Joliet, Illinois, outside Chicago, and, did, and we're stopped at Will County. And then we our final stop on that tour was in Indianapolis at the Knapp Town and White River. So um, had, covered a lot of ground, did that trip also in about 10 days, 12 days. So uh, covered a lot of ground. But uh, that's when we learned that we had to to really, those two trips, we learned that we really had to book in some more time to get to get yeah. work done. But Yeah, you got to slow but, down and take, yeah. it, take, and, it, and, t- take it in as you're going along. And I think that that's one of the big things that Michelle and I learned too is, you know, we got to have some time for ourselves, even if it's an afternoon or an evening or whatever it might be. And uh, so we, we kind of, we, you know, the third trip was the big trip out to California to meet. Uh, the ultimate goal was to meet uh, the other three owners, Mike, Joe, and Paul, who live in Southern California. We haven't been together in well over two years and uh, make a new locomotive announcement at Paul's club since the train fest didn't happen this year. But uh we also took some time to do some really cool things. We just south of Amarillo, Texas, uh, we dropped down and we went to, and I wish I could think of the name of it at the moment, but there's, it's just outside of Canyon, Texas. And there's this beautiful, it's the biggest, uh, I guess you'd call it Canyon outside the Grand Canyon in the United States. And uh, we took a little afternoon and went and saw that and took a lot of photos and posted on our Facebook page. And we chased the Transcon across uh, New Mexico for BNSF and, and went to Abo Canyon, which if you're a Santa Fe guy, you know, that's a big deal. Um, we took some time in Sedona when we went to see the, the Wyoming division that afternoon, we rented a side by side and went out to the desert and did off-road trails. So, you know, we had an opportunity to go do some fun stuff too. And, and if you, you know me, Lionel, I'm certainly not a small guy. I like to eat. (laughs) So, uh, we found some great restaurants along the way, you know, found a burger joint in Amarillo, right on route 66. And, you, you, know, should, uh, you should put that. I mean, I've been following along on the on the on the page. You should put like the burger joint. You should put pictures of that on your page too, because uh, you probably don't realize it, but I find it quite entertaining to follow along on this. Uh, well, yeah, we did put the burger joint up. That one was pretty cool, and, and there's a couple of other places okay. that we went to too that we put up. Because you know, I'm a I'm an off the beaten path kind of guy. Right. I like to. Um, Unfortunately, a lot of times there aren't, there's not time to, to really eat. Um, <laughs> there were days where you might have one meal because we, on the first trips, cause we were just running so hard. But, uh, this, this later trip, we definitely took some extra time. Um, and, and we, and the cool thing is too, we had a, a little more flexibility by having those days. Cause like when we were in Albuquerque, we did a meet and greet at an in scale club, but the day we got into town or the day, um, uh, we were invited over to see the HO club too. So we had a chance to get out and see them, and, uh, so there, there's more time. And boy, I'll tell you, some of the cool things, like when we were in Amarillo, um, we did a, the club there um, that's called the Amarillo Railroad Museum, and they an amazing layout that they're working on. But out back, they've got, that was the center for helium production. So they would they had a helium car, a real helium car out back. And then they have, and, I, I, and it's the only one in existence, they have the military ordnance train for nuclear weapons. And so there's this car that would have carried nuclear weapons, the warheads. And then they have two buffer cars, which I don't know why you need a buffer car. Cause if a, if a nuclear warhead goes off, you're not going to need it. But uh, uh, And then they had the guard cars with the turrets and everything, and they were totally self-sustained. So then that was something that was really kind of cool to see that you don't normally, you get a chance to well, check exactly. out. Exactly. And you probably didn't really even know that was there. That's the, probably the thing, like you're probably constantly stumbling across that's what I find the most frustrating about the podcast is the number of people I've met and the it seems like all the stuff I need to take in like like I didn't realize all this stuff even existed even some of the stuff you're talking about today like the Elton Depot and the Arizona Club and the Amarillo Museum like I didn't even know any of this, this stuff existed like I I just think this hobby and the and the encompassing rail fanning and model railroading and i always think of think of the two they're connected you can't but help but think they're connected but i just think this is so much bigger than any of us realize like as i know we just talked about that but is that kind of the are you kind of driving along and you half the time you feel like your mouth is dropped open because you're kind of, kind of going holy smokes oh yeah you know and there's so many different things to discovering and little things like, so when we drove from Oklahoma city to Amarillo, Texas, um, it was super windy that day, uh, sustained winds of, of 
30 to 40 miles an hour and gusts of 40 to 60. Well, you're, we're towing a 33 fifth foot fifth wheel <laughs> and it's like, it's like riding a boat going across there. But what was really amazing and you being from Canada, you'll know what this is like when it, when you're in a big snowstorm and you're watching the snow blow over the highway yeah. and it blows up and over the edge and it kind of cascades over and down across the highway. We're watching dirt do that. <laughs> I've never seen dirt do something. I'm like, it's like a dirt blizzard. <laughs> and, uh, and, and those are, and, and, and then like when you're out in the, in the, um, desert Southwest, I, uh, this is my wife's first time to see a cactus, you know, the big, like you see in an old Western and right. you kind of get excited about that stuff. Sure. And then, and then you, uh, as we're in the, in the Southwest, I didn't realize how mountain it is through, you know, Southern California and New Mexico and, and Arizona, and even in West Texas, um, it, you know, it's just such a diverse country and so many cool things to see. And, and, and I wish we had more time to stop, you know, as you're driving along, you see like this little railroad short line. It's like, man, that's cool. Love to get some photos, but we got to get to this next place. So you, so you keep on driving, but it's, it's a lot of fun. It, so, it's, so going forward, then you're going to leave more time to try to enjoy the, the trip as much as, much as the whole. We're going to, we're yeah. going to try, but it's hard. You know, we're, I'm starting to work on the Pacific Northwest trip, which will leave right around July the 4th. And we'll get back in late August in time for the national train show. And we're gone like eight to 10 weeks, but it's like just going and going and going. We are going to take though. Um, my wife is an avid wildlife photographer. And so we're going to spend about four or five days at Yellowstone. So, uh, and take a few days off and, and enjoy the wildlife there and shoot some grizzly bears and moose and all that kind of stuff. Well, make sure you use a telephoto lens when you're shooting the grizzly bears. Oh yeah, she's got a real long lens, and then we've got a spotting scope. So, <laughs> and you're kind of a small guy, so I would think to a grizzly bear, you'd look like a, just kind of an after dinner snack. Hey, all I gotta do is outrun my wife, but don't tell her. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm assuming that scale. Did you run into many people? Because I know we've talked about this before, where you're always kind of amazed, and and you don't say it in a in a, a, a I don't know a, a, a boasting way. But we've talked before about you're amazed that people haven't heard about scale trains. So did on this trip, were you, were you, what was the, what was your reaction? Like, what did you feel like? Uh, did, did you run into a lot of people that, oh, hey, this is really cool, but didn't know you, didn't really know much about you kind of thing. Did you run into a lot of those people? Yeah, <clears throat> you got a great story. So Clovis, New Mexico, um, you know, pretty off the beaten path, no hobby store for probably hundreds of miles from Clovis. And this club is in a mall, and they're right at Center Court in a in a, a, a what used to be a storefront, and they've got uh, a big HO running layout and in scale running layout, and um, they're open on the weekends, and folks in the mall can come and see them. And these guys, you know, there we did the presentation there and and got done, and and two of the guys, one of the guys comes up and he's like, "Man, I've always wanted a big blow turbine, but I've never seen one." And uh, he says, "Now that I've seen it, I'm, I want to." I want to order one. So he texts his wife and says, Hey, I'd really, really like to have this. And she's like, well, why don't you just order it? And another guy there, here's the conversation. He's like, I've always wanted one too, but I've never seen one. And he texts his wife and she's like, just order it. I'll get it for you for your Christmas and your birthday present. And here, we're talking to a couple of other guys who'd never seen our lo uh, rivet counter locomotive and all the detail. And, and, you know, they're like, and they're placing pre-orders. We probably sold like 10 locomotives that night. <laughs> and had we not been there, They'd never seen our stuff, and there's nowhere for them to see our product. There aren't many shows in that area. Yeah. Um. And and so it was a chance for us to to for them to see what we do, and and uh, and that's not an uncommon story. You know, sometimes we walk into a club like the one in Phoenix that has a ton of our product, and sometimes you walk into a club that has virtually none of our product, and it's that chance to really show them what we do and and how we do it, and and uh, I think that's what really helps us you know kind of grow our business because it's getting that out there and we're not afraid to get off the beaten path you know if you look at where clovis new mexico is on a map it's not near um you know a major interstate or anything like that or if you look at like where uh that crawford county club is in oblong illinois we, we met in a church and the interstate's nowhere close to that church and so uh would you call it we're ob not afraid oblong oblong yep like oblong a, illinois o, o b l o n g oblong that that's it. Yeah. 
I'm, yeah. I'd love to hear this story. I'd love to have been at the meeting when they decided how they were going to name their town. Well, we were hoping <laughs> for a square or, or an obtuse triangle, but we've come up with an oblong shape. So let's just call it oblong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, neat little town. So but, uh, can I uh, can I make an observation and you can correct me uh, one sure. way or the other? Um, sure. It's, I, I got the sense that when you started out, this was going to be about uh, bringing scale trains to the masses. Mm-hmm. And now after listening to you for the last half hour and following along on the on the Facebook page, now I'm getting the sense that, yes, that's still uh, a part of it. But now I'm getting the sense that it's more it's more become about meeting the people. And if you happen to sell some trains, that's great. But really. The connection with uh, with the population is really seems to be now start becoming the forefront and uh, the selling. You're, I mean, it's all about scale trains and it's a scale trains road trip. But it sounds it sounds like now it's becoming more about the connection you're making with the human race. Is that, mm-hmm. is that you know? I'm a firm believer and always have been that if you take care of the customer, they'll take care of you. And while that person might not actually be a customer yet, um, it's that connection with them. And, and it, it is, you know, I, it is way more than just, it's not. And, and that's one thing too, I, I, for the folks that are listening and when we do a meet and greet, it's not an infomercial about scale trains. It's not buy our product. Here's why you need to buy our product. We want to sell you our product. That's not it at all. It, it's more about, here's how we got started guys. It's, it's a miracle from God that we're you know, even right here having this conversation or that we're here at your club being able to share this story. It, it's, and without that modeler, there's no way we would exist. And, and it's an opportunity to educate folks on how model trains are made, you know, uh, it, and people are amazed. There's a lot of folks who have never seen the inside look at a factory and how much effort that goes into it. And, and you earn their respect because they know how much, how hard you work to try and bring them the best product you can. And, and, and I think the other thing too is we're not perfect. We'll never be perfect. I said that many times, but they know this helps them know that when we stub our toe, we're going to take care of them because we have a passion. We love what we do. We love our business. We love our employees, you know, and we love our customers. And we want to make sure that 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 whole circle of life is taken care of. Yeah, I think that's what I think that's what's happening to the hobby now because of the interconnection through through uh, technology. I think people. I think this hobby that has always been about, for sure, it starts out as your model railroader, and then you want to meet other model railroaders, get tips and tricks and all that. But then you discover the community. And I think what's happened now, more than anything, that the products are spectacular. Obviously, scale trains make spectacular products, as do other companies. But now the community has become this thing that nobody ever imagined was possible. And now mm-hmm. it's you just have this warm fuzzy feeling everywhere you go and you can't help but i mean look at us i mean just you know here i am i got my little podcast going and i got and i'm on i got my sticker on the back of your trailer and it's it's, and we're doing this and it's just like every you know you and i could easily you and i never met when and we've built up a friendship over the last seven years it's like you and i could spend a day together and be quite happy doing it and it's all because absolutely all because of the hobby absolutely Yep. Yeah, yeah. It's just uh, I think that I just I can hear in your voice that this is just a massive success, which is fun for me because I thought it would be like I really had no one opinion one way or other. And I thought, well, I can't see how this won't be a success. And now it just sounds like it's been a, an absolute blessing almost. <laughs> You're probably sitting there going, I can't believe I came up with this idea. But what a great idea, because I know you were a little apprehensive there at the start. And I bet you you haven't had any 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 qualms about hey you're rolling out there with a big beautiful trailer and a big beautiful truck but that's part of what that's part of the uh, uh that's part of it that's you know you're a successful company and you're sharing this success with people by being able to go out there and visit with them i think yeah that's, that's absolutely it and, and the cool thing too is you know we get we we have giveaways everywhere we go oh yeah and, yeah and there's a goodie bag that's got lionel's uh buttons in it and and other things you know modelers like buttons and and we're we're giving away hats and shirts and train cars and all kinds of stuff to, and it it is and it's it's way bigger than I thought it would be. I, I was hopeful, you know, I was really hopeful, and and this might sound crazy, Lionel, but 
every time I walk into a meet and greet and there's people there, I thank God. Cause I, I always have this fear that, that we'll do a meet and greet. Nobody's going to show up, yeah. you know, and, and, uh, and, and maybe that's an irrational fear, but you know, I don't want people thinking, I don't want to go listen to scale trains. They're just going to try to sell me for the next hour. And that's, yeah, that's not it at all. And, uh, to have people show up and, and be genuinely interested in, in what you do and, and be, and they're all, you know, models are almost vested in our company at this point. You know, you talk about that success and, and we've been blessed beyond our wildest imagination. But the cool thing is, is, is we're bringing people along for the ride. You know, you talk about our relationship and how we've got to know each other, um, the last seven years and, and how things have grown and evolved and changed and, and, I think that's one of the cool things is, is as we have that personal connection, we can bring folks along for that ride. So they, they truly know that they are a partner in our success. Yeah. Like I know I've had a few people contact me and say, you know, how can I laughter the first time we uh, did it? I had a few uh, emails saying, so is there a schedule and stuff? And I said, yeah, they set up a, you know, people are looking forward for you to come to their, their town or their, their part of the country. Like I know when you make the Northeast, I'm going to, hook up with you guys because it's just a fun, but I think it's, uh, I get so excited about all this kind of stuff because the world is changing so fast and the hobby is changing so fast. I just wish I was like 20 years younger so I could enjoy it longer because <laughs> it's just, a just a great idea. Okay. So let me, uh, did, so what is a meet and greet sort of like, give us a rough idea what a meet and greet is like. You get there and you, you and your wife go, I guess. So we arrive about an hour early and, uh, if the club is open to it, we'll bring our dog along. Uh, we've got a, uh, just a, a small dog. She's a good girl and, and, uh, she'll come and hang out and we'll set up the product. It takes about 30 minutes. Usually the club will help us set up too, which is always appreciated. And, uh, we have about 30 minutes before the event starts to kind of mingle and meet folks. And my wife, um, shoots video and, and photography. So we've got a lot of content coming out of the club and, one of the things I want to start doing, we haven't allotted enough time for, but I'd like to start interviewing each club um, so that we've got uh, their story to tell as well. Uh, and then, yeah, and then we, um, <clears throat> uh, it's, then we'll start at the top of the hour. We usually start at seven all in the evening. It depends though, but normally around at seven and we'll take maybe 40 minutes and we'll talk about how the idea of scale trains came to be. And, uh, you know, we'll talk about the first business plans and what it's like to, to start a model train company and what the resources that you need and what it, and then as part of that, we weave in how model trains are made and, and we'll talk about the product development process. We'll show some video uh, of us, um, whether it's documenting a, a locomotive or going to the factory and seeing how the engineering's done or the tooling is done. And then we'll talk about like how we unveiled the company and, and, and the move to Tennessee and how we ended up in Tennessee and, and why it's just such a blessing that the how the uh, we acquired the office and the warehouse and the land and we'll, we do a little bit about the, how when we unveiled the company you were there at the preview party and and uh, and then we'll talk about uh, where we are and uh, and then we uh, we open it up for questions and answer. <coughs> take a take a drink. You got a drink there or something? Yeah. Take a drink. Take, take, we'll put in the elevator music while you're refreshing your throat. And then after the meet and greet, we uh, after the meet and greet, we hang out and. Uh, We'll answer all the questions everybody has. You know, Michelle's really knowledgeable, uh, as well as myself. And and uh, and then we'll, if time allows, we'll run trains on the railroad and and hang out on the railroad and maybe shoot some more video and pictures and chat with folks. And you know, normally yeah. we'll start a meet and greet at seven and last like forty minutes, and we'll maybe do twenty minutes of Q and A. So it's about an hour, right? <laughs> and then maybe we'll hang around another hour or so. But you know, it's amazing because like at Amarillo. <laughs> we get done and, and they actually do custom run cars. I'm buying this car and I look at my phone for the date because I'm, I'm giving them some stuff and I'm like, Holy smokes, it's midnight. We got to get out of here. We're going to wear out our welcome. Holy so, holy. <laughs> so you so sometimes it runs a little longer than you expect, but we're usually out by nine or 10 o'clock. 
Right. Jeez. So, so the actual presentation's about an hour, and then yeah. uh, then hanging around afterwards, and then I know you always make yourself available. Pretty, you're pretty much yeah. like, you know, you're, you're they they always talk about Gordy Howe or some some other sports. There's always these sports guys, you know, that they'll talk about, you know, the guy that always stands and signs every single autograph, and he'll be there for hours, and that's. I've seen you in action, and that's the kind of guy you are. You'll sign every autograph. You know, you'll yep. talk to every person that has a question. You know, that's funny. You bring that up. One of the coolest things I got to do, and it's crazy, but it's I thought it was really cool. We were at the Naptown of White River in Indianapolis, and they had me autograph their wall as you come into their clubhouse. Oh, cool. And I so I wrote a little note there, and then and then signed it. Man, I'm like that is so cool. And then I'm I'm always humbled. And, and so flattered and honored um people come up to us my wife and i and and they'll have us autograph boxes and so i always write a little note to anybody who has me sign their box and you know even like when we were in california at the, at, at uh, paul ellis he's one of our founders at his club all four of us as founders were together my wife and and uh, charles who's one of our product developers and you know we have people there and we were all of us were signing their, their boxes and and uh it's just amazing that people have that much respect and appreciate our product that much that they'd want us to do that. That is so cool to me. Yeah, it's cool, isn't it? It's just cool that people people want to interact with you. I mean, it's just uh yep. And you, and you and the thing that makes it cool is that was never your intention. You were never your intention was never hey, look at me. This is what I'm doing. Your intention was, yeah, you wanted to, it, it was an industry you'd been in all your life. You'd been a model railroader. Let's remind people that at, what was the age that you had your own little kind of hobby shop or something? Well I, well, I started in the hobby when I was probably four years old. And I opened the hobby store when I was 15, about ready to turn 16. Yeah. <laughs> so so you are a lifelong, you are a legitimate lifelong model railroader buried deep in the hobby. And uh, so, I mean, like I say, it was never your intention when you started Scale Trains to become famous from it. It was more an intention mm -hmm. of nope. using all of your skill to build a product that was was uh, special for the hobby, and now it's just morphed into the all the all that goes along with it, which is what makes it so special to the person. And, you know, being on the end of the being the person that's being asked to to autograph a box, people need to realize it, it's just as special to you as it is to them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, you know, absolutely, it is because I can't believe it's like. You know, I, I joke with my wife sometimes after we do something like that. I'm like, you know, I put my pants on like any other guy, one leg at a time. I'm just, I'm just a guy, you know, and I, and, and sometimes I'm almost embarrassed because I, I'm like, I can't believe people feel this passionately about our company and our product and our people to ask us to do something like this. It's like this, that just blows me away, Yeah, you know, because when we started, we did, we did have a pretty lofty goal. And that was to earn the respect of the model railroad community and, and become a top tier manufacturer. But you know, as you said, it wasn't it wasn't about the accolades. That's not what we were going for. We just wanted to know by becoming a top tier manufacturer that just affirms that that we we did what we set out to do and that we're making awesome product. Yeah, and that, just so everybody knows, I've been <clears> with Shane. I've shared a hotel room with him once, and I we were at a show, a big show somewhere, and. He had actually put on his pants backwards, and I had to very, very quietly say, yeah, Shane. <laughs> but but yeah, he does put them on. Well, I, even if he puts them on forwards or backwards, they're one, it's one leg at a time. It is one leg at a time. <laughs> People are going to want to know what you were doing in a hotel room if you want to put on pants, but we're not going to go there. <laughs> exactly. Um, so have you, did you, did you, have you sold, while you're on doing this, have you sold more product than you expected? Like, did you take more orders than you expected? That that part's kind of hard to to, to judge, um, just because we don't carry anything with us to sell. Right. That logistically, there's it's just too challenging. But we definitely see upticks in our web traffic um, in the regions that we go to. Okay. So that is having an impact, and uh, you know, and, and really to me, it's not about the sale that day or around that time. It, it I liken it, and this this is probably a bad analogy, but. I, you know, Lionel, you bought a car before, bought many, I'm sure, in your lifetime. And and I've been to dealers, to a car dealer where they're going to sell you one car and that's going to be it. And I've been to dealers that want to be to sell you a car every time you buy for the rest of your life. And and those are the ones that cultivate that relationship and want you as a customer. And I kind of liken it to that 
it's kind of a bad, I don't know if it's, it, it, it sounds kind of weird, but I'd rather cultivate a lifelong customer. They might not buy today, tomorrow, next week, but when they, when the product comes along that, that we make that they want, they'll find it in their budget to buy that product and they'll continue to buy that product. So to me, it's about, a, you know, hobbyists are lifelong hobbyists. There are folks that do come and go from the hobby, but most people, once the bug bites them, it's, it's there forever. And so we want to be that forever manufacturer for them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I, and I can easily attest to that. I have, I have never felt any pressure to buy your product. And I mean, I've hung around you a long time, but I mean, I, honestly, I think, I think the hobby's number one for you. Success for your business is a very, very close second, I would say like very, 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 very close. You want your business to be su- successful. Who doesn't want their business to be successful? You wouldn't go into business if you didn't want to be successful, but I don't, I see it as more of, I'd see it as more of, if you, if you're going to do it, you want the hobby to, to, to succeed even more from your efforts. And I can guarantee you anybody that meets Shane in person, number one, he's happy to talk to you. You can talk to him at a, the National Train Show. You can talk to him in Springfield. You can talk to him wherever on a road trip. You can talk to him wherever. You will never feel pressured to buy the product. He wants to tell you about the product and let the product sell itself. Mm-hmm. That's a great way to say it. Well, and, and it's funny you say that because as I look around my office here, um, I'm looking at tangent boxes and exact rail boxes and Athern Genesis and Rapido and and all these other boxes, right? And those are things that I bought for myself. Because if 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 we can grow the hobby as an industry, we all grow as manufacturers. And we're and and the one thing something you said just a moment ago about kind of where the hobby is for me and where our business is, while the success of the business is important to me, you know, the hobby is very important. And I'd say the next most important thing to me is we have 19 employees in in four states. And it and to me, it's making sure that their families are provided for, and that we give them we give them the opportunity to earn a living that provides them a life um, that that is um, I don't know if the word's bountiful, but is fulfilling. That's the word I'm looking for. Uh, provides our employees a life that's fulfilling. That to me is way more important. And 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 <clears throat> to me, the success is a byproduct. It's you know as I talk about that lifelong customer. Same idea, right? I mean, we take care of the customer; they take care of us, and the success comes as a byproduct of that. One of my, one of my self, one of my greatest accomplishments in life is easily that I have. I've got twelve employees. I've got two of them have worked for me over thirty-two years. Another guy's been there almost twenty-five. Another guy's been there eighteen. My employees come and they stay, which mm-hmm. is just one of the most rewarding things. And then, actually, as we went through this pandemic, my business had to be shut down literally closed and shut down for 49 weeks off and on. And uh, the government was giving some assistance, but one of the probably one of the greatest things and uh, successes that I think of my business life and as my adult life is that I was able to help all of my employees financially from the com- from the company funds to help them get through the, so that they were able to stay and stay as employees and come back when the business opened you were mentioning, I think that's something that there would be, this is a good spot to talk about because we never really talked about it. And, and, uh, I've talked to Jason Tron and he says that he, he talks to you. There isn't, I think, uh, it's important for people to know there, there, it's, it appears to be on the outside. It appears to be competitive that the leading manufacturers are all trying to sell the right product to get people, but it, there, there isn't a ton of animosity between one company and another. Like if somebody is cordial to you, you're happy to respond. And I, you know, I know, like I say, Jason says he talks to you. And I mean, like you say, you got tangent and exact rail. So there's not this, it seems one of the, one of my bugaboos about the hobby or because I interview so many people is it seems like there's this cloak and dagger thing where, you know, you can't tell anybody what you're doing and blah, blah, blah. And we've talked about that before, but it's not, it's really more a case of, well, geez, we don't want to produce the same thing that you guys are going to produce because no, then we're only, nobody's going to sell anything. So it's not a, it's not a competition as much as it's a, it's a living together side by side sort of thing. Like you say, you have box, you have tangent boxes and repeatable boxes and exact rail boxes because they also make a product that you're, you're mm-hmm. interested yep. in. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's not just this constant 
battle between the well, manufacturers. Well, you know, you, you talk about that. I, I talk to Tangent pretty regular. I, I, I was on the phone with the folks at Exact Rail right before Thanksgiving. Uh, I haven't talked to Jason in a while, but we, we do touch base and exchange emails. And um, <clears throat> it's a small industry. I was just, you know, even with the guys like at MTH, I was exchanging emails with Andy Edelman uh, just last week, seeing if he's coming to Springfield so we can get together and, and just have a bite to eat. You know, it, it, it's a small industry and, and yes, it is a business and we have to treat it like a business. Uh, but in that same vein, uh, I don't have a problem calling up and picking up the phone, talking to anybody or walking up to someone at a show and, and having that, you know, and, and that's, that is one of the things that's kind of been missing as the last two years as we haven't had any shows. I'm kind of looking forward to Springfield because there's folks that, that I enjoy seeing and visiting with that, that I haven't, haven't had time to spend, you know. I haven't seen Ken Silvestri at Broadway in quite a while. Ken's a funny guy. Always enjoy visiting with him. There's a lot of people like that. You should come to the you should come to the AML dinner on Saturday night. Boom. This Saturday night? No. The Saturday night at Springfield. Oh, Saturday night at Springfield. Yeah, we have a we have, uh, we have dinner with our fans and uh you'd be a you would be a welcome guest. If you were available, that would be great. You could uh actually you could do a little uh do a little uh, five minute talk while you were there. That'd be great. Think well, let's it. chat about that offline. We'll chat about that offline. Uh, yeah, let's uh, chat about that. Yeah. Uh, um, all right. So now the next road trip is going to be when? Let's let's get that straight now. Okay. So I'm, we're working on the the stops right now, but we're going to um, Florida and the Gulf states in uh, the middle of February through uh, the middle of March, and uh, so that's coming up. We'll be announcing that probably right at the beginning of January. Uh, with all the dates and the stops and locations. And then uh, probably going to take a little bit of a break in the spring. And then um, in the summertime, we're going to definitely go. We're going out to the Pacific Northwest and uh, be gone like eight to ten weeks. And then in the fall, uh, we'll be heading up. <clears throat> we're going to do the Berea train show again. We haven't done that in a few years. And then from there, we're going to take off and go up through New England. Uh, and then uh, we're actually going to drop down to the Carolinas. We've got been invited to be a keynote speaker at an NMRA regional. So uh, that'll probably be the it for, for next year. We might put in a couple of other uh, states, uh, times, but uh, one thing we learned is I think the road trip will probably extend yeah. well into 23 yeah. um, just because we need to, we need more time. Well, but that'll only make it more, that'll only make it more spectacular in the fact that it just goes longer. Yeah. And, and the thing is too, and I think this is important, you know, you and I had joked in the, in the first time we were talking about the road trip when we were talking about George Thurgood and the destroyers, they did um, 50 tour dates in 50 days. And we talked about doing 50 States in 50 weeks. Well, if we do that, we can only do like one date in a state. And, uh, and we're really working out like Florida. I think we'll probably have six to eight dates in Florida that we'll do. And, uh, and so in this, and like when we go to Texas, then we'll probably have six to eight dates in Texas. So we'll hit pretty much every major city. Yeah. Uh, along the way and then even some and some of the off of the beaten path places too so uh while it while we'll be on the road longer it, it'll give us a chance to meet even more people the only the only way it's changed is that it's gotten better because mm -hmm. because okay the, now it's not going to be uh 50 states in 50 days it's going to be this you know two and a half three year thing of where you go out and you and i and i bet you you know as you're coming to the end, you're kind of thinking, well, we could always go here. Like, I don't think this road trip will technically ever end now. I mean, well, it's funny you say that we, my wife and I were joking, you know, we probably ought to do like a 10 year, the, you know, like a 10 year recap and, and, and hit some of the key places again that we've gone to. Cause there's, there's definitely places that we visited that we would like to go again, both personally and professionally. Yeah. Oh yeah. This is such a great idea. I can see you, I can see you almost every year, even if you go out for a week to some place and you you hit a you hit a show along the way or a meet and greet because this whole meet and greet idea is such, such a great idea. I mean, it's bringing the hobby to people and everything. It's like, <sighs> well, somebody gave us a great idea. I was here's another one, right? We talk about expanding. I was on a podcast for the RV industry because they'd seen the RV and they wanted okay, us. Okay, that was cool. That's industry. cool. Yeah, so we were on Stressless Camping's uh, podcast and and they threw an idea at me and I'm like, that's pretty freaking cool. So I'm thinking for the 10 year anniversary, we buy a toy hauler and we put a model train layout in the back of the toy hauler. So people <laughs> come in and run products. Yeah, that is a, that is a cool idea. Um, I'm like, man, why didn't we think of that? 
Yeah, yeah, but I think what you're doing is pretty good. So how did stressless yeah. camping get a hold of you? Well, you know how I talked about uh, every t- every stop that we make, somebody comes to see us. So we're in Camp Verde, Arizona, and uh, beautiful campground there. And we're packing up, and this guy walks up, and he says, Hey, uh, I'm from Stressless Camping, and I saw your rig, and and kind of wondering what you do. And we got to talking, and he says, Man, I'd love to have you on my podcast. And we exchanged information, and I was on the podcast earlier this week. So it was with uh, Tony and Peggy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking at the Do you web- know them? No, no, I'm looking, oh, you're at, looking at their, their website. website. Yeah, I'm looking at their website. Yeah. But how cool would that be? Like, that's the thing. We have no idea. I know I go on and on and on, and I do apologize to everybody that listens, but I am telling you, this hobby is going to absolutely explode, and we're all going to be covered in model railroad goo because of all the connections. <laughs> this hobby was, I believe that social media and the internet was was solely invented for the purpose of model railroading. I can't, uh, you know, that's my that's my line, and I'm sticking with it because... I can't see how it can be any of anything else other than that. <laughs> like, well, you know, it's funny. You talk about these guys from Stressless Camping. They owned a bed and breakfast with like 10 cabooses in Northern California one well, time. There you go. <laughs> so there's his connection to trains. Yeah, exactly. Endless. It's endless. It's just. All right. So uh, I guess we'll wrap this up. So I'll probably see you in Florida, actually, because I'll just uh, wherever you are, I'll just uh, either ride over on my Harley or. Whatever, whatever you're doing, I'll uh, I'll catch up with you probably in Florida. Well, I'll tell you what. When we get the dates finalized, I'll send you a preview ahead of time. And yeah, if do you that. can, uh, if you if you can make it, we'll advertise that. Hey, Lee Lionel Strang from Amadur's <laughs> Life is going to be at this meet and greet. And if you want to meet a bigger than life personality, come and come and meet Lionel. All right, that's a, that's a deal because it'll be a lot of fun to see you guys in Florida. And 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 oh, it'll be great. And interview you on the fly. That'd be great. You know, I'll come by and I'll have a, one day you can cook me a burger on your barbecue out there by the, by, it'd be fun to see it in person. Yeah, we'll have you come over to the RV and we'll hang out in the RV. It's yeah. nice. Yeah, I'll bet it is. Uh, what a, what a, what have you learned about RVing that didn't, uh, that has surprised you the most? Because, I mean, you're complete greenhorns at this. That's something people need to realize. This isn't like you and your wife have been out, out RVing for the last uh, tw- 10 or 15 years and you are well, you're we, avid campers, but like well, actually we have been. We've been I we've knew been that. um yeah. <laughs> don't ever correct we, don't ever we've correct been the host. Since a... <laughs> don't ever correct the host. <laughs> well, we we uh started camping when, when our son was not even a year old and he's twenty one, just turned twenty one yesterday. Okay. But we we've had a pop up and we've had a hard side and we've had a um a hybrid camper. This is our first fifth wheel, so we are greenhorns to the fifth wheel. Um you know, I, from an RV standpoint, I don't think there's anything that that's surprised us too much. I think the biggest challenge is because we're commercial, we have to meet DOT regulations. So we have to log all of our miles and hours and and uh, be tracked, you know, um, by GPS satellite and all that kind of stuff. And we had to have health um, uh, physicals for DOT and, and uh, inspections and all those kind of things. And that that's been the only thing that's really been the experience because, like, uh, we had a pretty – ugly experience and going into new mexico i didn't realize that you're supposed to have a a trip permit when you come into the state and they weren't very happy because we didn't have one (laughs) but thankfully they didn't fine us or anything but they made it really clear that we had three days to get out of the state if we didn't we could be arrested wow or fined yeah it was kind of weird but that's because we're commercial and and i didn't have all the all the things the i's dotted and t's crossed but we we, you know we learned and that's the stuff we're figuring out but from an rv standpoint it's it's been uh, it's been what we expected, you know. There's some maintenance that definitely needs done on the RV after traveling ten thousand miles, but that's just part of it. Um, do you notice tire wear after ten thousand miles on the trailer tires? It's funny you say that. Um, we noticed that the rear axle, when we pull into the gas station, at times looked like it was canted inwards, and uh, we we drove hard coming home from California. We want to get home for Thanksgiving, and uh, even though I inspected every day. Because that's part of your 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 DOT thing, we uh, we wore the inside tire on the rear axle of the RV, and it actually have to have axle work done and, and new tires put on the back of the RV. So, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and it's DOT. It's DOT because it's uh, owned by Scale Trains and not a personal. Not that's a right. Personal yeah. Person. If 
if it was a personal vehicle, um, we're right at 20,000 pounds between the truck and the trailer loaded. And uh, if it was personal, we could go anywhere we wanted to, but because it's commercial, we have to do DOT. That's one of the reasons that we haven't decided whether we're coming to Canada yet, um, because we would have to meet Canadian DOT. And I'm still trying to figure out the U.S. version uh, <laughs> and, without adding that on yet. Um, and do you wish? Do you have any? Do you wish you'd gone personal, or you just felt like this was the safest way to go because you wanted to cover it with scale trains, and it was going to be owned by the actually owned by the company, and that was just the most logical way to go. Well, you'll you'll find that I, I'm one that likes to kind of do things the right way, or try to at least, and I'm not always perfect at it. And I'd contacted the state, um, regulat- uh, like the Tennessee Highway Patrol that regulates commercial, and I talked to them about it. And uh, the officer was really good. And one of the things he said to me is he said that, uh, you know, you could take that risk, and you could get out there, and you could um, run it as, as private. But if we pull you over, or you have an accident, and we find that you're commercial, uh, number one, we can, if we pull you over, we can pull you off the road and tell you you can't, you can't move and because you're not meeting the regulations. And, uh, and he said also, too, if you have an accident and we find out you're commercial and you have it registered or personal, the liability that you have personally in an accident, um, you could lose everything. Okay. So, you know, we're, we're carrying several million dollars worth of liability insurance on the truck sure. and trailer so that if um, better safe than sorry. Absolutely. Uh, and, and, and try to do it the right way. Yeah. So that makes perfect sense. You got, you get to talk to a, a state trooper and, uh, yeah, you got, yeah. So it makes perfect sense. I was just interested because so in, in New Mexico, like, was there, uh, I guess most States, like when you pull into Florida, there's a, there's a, uh, truck port of entry. A, yeah. Way, way station in at the, mm-hmm. so is there, there was like a port of a way station in the border of New Mexico, eh? Yeah, so it's kind of different there. What they do is they call it port of entry, and every commercial vehicle coming into the states has to stop at this port of entry, and they weigh you. <clears throat> and, of course, we have a DOT number on the truck door, so um, they can plug that into the DOT and see, and get all of our information. And because we weighed <laughs> at 20,000 pounds, they're like, come on inside. You need <laughs> – they, they weren't very friendly about come on inside. But uh, And when I went inside, I was sweating bullets because I wasn't sure what was going to happen. But uh, – and the lady was not friendly, but that's okay. And then actually coming back from California, we pull into New Mexico at the port of entry on this. We came in on the north side going out, and then we came in on the, the south side coming back. And we pull into port of entry, and I look over, and there's this uh, 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 state trooper coming in a pickup truck, pulls up beside us, talks to the way station guy, and we pull up to the way station guy, and he looks at us and goes, trooper wants to see you in the back. And I'm like, oh, crap. <laughs> so we, we pull around back, and, and he he come swinging around the front of the truck and blocks us and and uh, he did a full inspection he was super though i told him what had happened on the way in he apologized for that person and the way they treated us and and he was super he let me ask him a lot of questions and because i don't know i mean i'm not a full-time truck driver i I don't know what i'm supposed to be doing i'm trying to figure it out and he was super cool and uh, he did an inspection and put a sticker on the truck and told us that you know now for the next 90 days Every time you pull in a way station across the country, they'll see that, and odds are they won't pull you over and inspect you because they know that you've had one recently. So, oh, that's, no, cool. that's kind of I mean, learning, just learning. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of a that's a that's again it goes back to, you know, here we are talking. It's a model railroad podcast, and we you know spend most of our time talking. But that's an interesting side <laughs> story. That's what I find the most interesting about the podcast is all the side stories and interesting stuff I learn about. Uh, well, I think that's it. So I think we've covered it all. We've done pretty good. So one last, uh, one question I did want to ask you though, you, you said you went to that, that club in Sedonia or whatever, what I think it's called cotton wood or something. Isn't it that place? I don't know. Are you talking about the Wyoming division? Yeah. Yeah. That's the one in Cornville. Cornville. Just outside of Sedona. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. And did you go to any other, did you go to any home layouts along the way? Um, have not gone to any home layouts yet, but there have been some that we've been invited to, and I'm sure that we will. The The hardest part has been, and I think this is part that, I think a few people have been frustrated with this, where they've contacted us while we're on the road, and they're like, hey, we see you're coming to town, and you'll be here in a day or two. Can you come do this? And it's like, love to, but yeah, we really have to plan our time, because the hardest part is we have to keep the business running back here in Tennessee and, and keep the development team going and all those things, but uh, I think that's one thing we're definitely want to do more of, and that's why we're trying to book in more time, and that's why we're going to probably spend more time on the road than we plan. 
Uh, let's, uh, before we close this up, let's uh, give everybody a heads up again. We did talk about it last time, but let's re- remind everybody. So if somebody wants you to come and give a, a talk at their club uh, or show, what exactly is it they need to do? So you go to scaletrains.com slash road trip, and uh, you'll see a red uh, box that says road trip club visit form. You click on that box, uh, fill out the form, and uh, it'll come to us. And um, as we, we, it's really hard for us to be able to follow up on every one of them immediately because there's so many. But as we get to your region of the country, uh, we'll definitely reach out to you. And, and uh, all we look for, and, and this isn't a hard and fast rule, but we'd like to have 25 people come to a meet and greet. Um, we've had less. We've had a lot more. Uh, but that, on average, that's what we're looking for. Uh, and, and if you think you can have 25 folks and you want to invite other clubs in the area or other model railroaders open up to the general public. Um, and, uh, and that's what we're looking for. We've done meet and greets at in-scale railroads. We've done them at HO model railroads. We've done them, as I mentioned, at a church. Um, we've done them in community buildings. So it doesn't necessarily have to be actually at a club itself. It can, it can be at a venue. So, uh, and, and we're just looking to share the story. And so that makes it kind of easy. Um, okay. So I'm on the scaletrains.com website right now. So what am I looking mm-hmm. for? Um, go to scaletrains.com slash road trip. Oh, okay. So you got to put in forward slash road trip. Yeah. We don't have it up on the homepage right now because we don't have any dates going on. Uh, you gotta, yeah, but you should have a link there. Come on, you guys. Just have a link. Don't make me be typing forward slash road trip. Now, see, now I, now I, oops, are bad. The page requested was not found. Now, what am I doing wrong? Uh, do I have to, do I have to do it? So scale trains road trips, forward slash road trips. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not getting no, it. Just no S on the end, just road trip. Oh, my goodness gracious. See, that's a lot of work. You should just have a link on there. I found it. Whoever's in charge, of, I, whoever's listening to this at Scale Trains and whoever's ever in charge of the website, just put a link, Scale Trains Road Trip. They'll just put the little map thing and then people don't have to type stuff in. Oh, but, there's something while you're there that's really cool. Roll down to the bottom of the screen. Okay. There's a slider there. And you'll see that some of the things that are popping up. Right. And like you'll see a house. Um. That house went viral on TikTok. We sh- this was at the um, this was in Iowa at the uh, Hawkeye Model Railroad Club in Coralville. They have this little like Sears and Roebuck house, and you as you take it apart floor by floor, when you get to the basement, there's a Model Railroad, and <laughs> uh, and that has got hundreds and hundreds of thousands of views on TikTok. And then there's also one there where you see a thunderstorm that was shot at Oklahoma City. Oh yeah, there's and, the house. Uh, yes, there's the <clears throat> house. Wow, that is cool. Yeah, that is cool, and it shows all the play. Uh, it shows okay. So there's a, this is. A, you guys should have a link on your main page to this page without making me type something in. Come on. Normally we do. Normally we do, right. and we will get that back up. We just went to a new website though, so there's some oh, things we're still. Yeah, learning. I noticed that. Eh? It looks like a whole new website. Wow. Mm-hmm. And uh, and what what per, what uh, what was the reason for that? Just. Uh, Got, yeah, that's something. Uh, we're not talking road trip now, but we're still talking scale trains. Uh, you got a new website, and do you have to kind of do companies of your size? It seems like a, a friend of mine, uh, Tim Morris at Fast Tracks, a good friend of mine. We were often talking about the business, and he made a new website a couple of years ago. Do you have? Is it something you're constantly chasing, trying to keep your internet presence as uh, as as fresh as possible? Is, is um. <laughs> Ours is more like a saga, um, <laughs> and I'll I'll give you the short version. When we went live back in 2015 at TrainFest, the web platform we were on within moments crashed and burned. Um, we had it took us about a week to get it to where we needed it. Um, but there is no off the shelf website platform that does pre orders like our industry, where you take a pre order, you don't pay for it now, and you pay for it when it comes in, and over the last seven years, <clears throat> we've been. This is our third web platform change. Um, and on the first web platform, we had two custom built pre order systems that failed miserably. Uh, we went to a new web platform just over two years ago. It was a a big leap forward in the pre order system, uh, and it was it worked fairly well on where the on the customer facing side, but on the back end side, it's been what nightmares are made of. And so uh, almost two years ago, or almost not shortly after that site went live, we started working on this site. And uh, this is custom built from the ground up, especially for, for us. 
built by a company that's done websites for uh, businesses like Salt Life, Maglite, the Detroit Pistons, the Carolina Panthers, uh, pretty heavy hitter web uh, development company. And uh, the idea here is, and there's some tweaks, there's some, you know, there's things you don't know until you go live, unfortunately. And there's some tweaks that we, that we've got to make to make it a little, uh, to help a little bit. But there are so many things that this web platform will do for us in the coming years. We don't, we don't expect to make a major web shift now for at least 10 years. Um, That's kind of the goal. And we can run, if we wanted to start other websites, uh, which we will probably do at some point, uh, we can uh, run them all off of this web platform. So this is this is a full commerce, yeah, high end web platform. It looks like it. It looks like it's very very professional and very very user friendly. So I was complaining that there was no link to the road trip page, but you know you always give compliments when you're giving criticism. However. This uh, slider at the bottom of the page, what I really like about it is there's constantly different pictures going by, but below it is a, is it tells you all the different uh, areas and what they are. So I, I really commend you on that. Uh, this is a great, you guys, come on, get a link on your main page to the road trip page. This is well worth seeing. Whether you're on the road yeah, or not, this, whether you're on the road or not, this is well, well worth seeing. Holy mackerel. This is a great page. The whole website is awesome. Well, I really like. Thank it. you. Well, that's appreciated, and I will pass that along because there, you know, it, like any website, when you go live, there's definitely some pains um, because uh, no matter how much you test, there's just things that that you just don't know. Who's and uh, <clears throat> and we're having a couple of uh, pretty major hiccups right now, but we're getting them fixed, and and it'll be much better. Have you ever not have has scale trains or any company in mind? I think that's part of. Would this not be a fair statement? I've never thought of this until this very moment. But would this not be a fair statement? Because model railroading isn't a huge industry, it's a substantial industry, but not huge. Is it fair to say that model railroading companies the size of yours that are successful are constantly running into hiccups because because you're oh, not yeah. because you're not, you know, you're always kind of moving forward to the next level where you know bef- bef- where no man has gone before kind of thing in this industry. Yeah. yeah and, and- Across the board, right? I mean, like just yesterday, we've got another container getting ready to leave China, and uh, and getting a container right now is really challenging, and rates go up again, right? You know, yeah. Uh, March we're paying five to seven thousand dollars, and yesterday we learned we're going to spend probably twenty to twenty two thousand dollars for the container. Holy mackerel! And uh, and that's part of that ebb and flow and bob and weave. You know, you got to. That's it's, just, it's it's business. That's really what sure, it is. It's yeah, just it's business. business. That's a three hundred percent increase just on the container alone. Yeah, and the and, pro- and we're absorbing all of that cost. Well, uh, yeah, and that's part of the problem too. Is you can only absorb the cost for so long until you have to pass mm-hmm. it along to the consumer because otherwise, because you've got to have you've got to make money in order to pay your employees to keep the company going and do new projects. So, I mean, you can only absorb so much of that cost until I you- think one thing too. You talk about uniqueness and i don't think people think about this but for twenty two thousand dollars that's a lot of freight cars you have to sell to make a profit to to be able to do that oh yeah that's, a lot of freight cars yeah like that's exact that's a that's a podcast in its own i mean i think i think the industry is you know is on the verge of having to make some sort of i don't know what's going to happen but you cannot ignore these that, that's probably what i was trying to say before uh, uh, if um, I don't know, let's say uh, if the Gap, the Gap, which is a which is a well known company, a big company, has stores in every mall and every city. If they have to pay twenty two thousand dollars for a container instead of five, they can absorb that cost a lot easier than scale trains with nineteen employees. That's right, absolutely. So that's a that's a huge problem that people need to be aware of, and and, and the other challenge too that that folks don't think about is. Um, we had 30 day payment terms. Now you have to pay for it the day it goes on the boat or you won't get space the next time. Mm-hmm. And in the past, it was about five weeks door to door. So you would have normally we'd have we'd have a container arriving and one leaving. Well, now we might have two or three containers in play. Well, you take that now and that's twenty two thousand or, you know, a container. Yeah. So that money's spent. And then you have you have to pay for that inventory that's inbound, and when it's several hundred thousand dollars per shipment, 
now you you're really tying up your cash flow and you're really dipping into your line of credit because the product is not flowing as fast. So, you know, it's it, but it's business. I'm not I hope folks don't take this as complaining because it certainly isn't. It's just the nature of the beast. It's it's what we do. And you just have to be able to bob and weave and ebb and flow. Yeah, that's, I'm not. That's I'm not. What it is. I, yeah, like I don't think people should take that. I, I don't hear it as complaining. I hear it as I, I can only imagine it's frustrating to try. Well, I mean, let's face it. My own business was literally the government closed the doors on us for 49 weeks. You know, man, I can't imagine. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, talk about bobbing and weaving and you kind of go. And I mean, literally. They had kind of forgotten about it. They locked down the province for the first for four months. And then I knew I said they've forgotten about us. And, uh, you know, and then another wave would come and they'd lock you down again because we were, you know, we're in close contact with the public. And I mean, you know, like uh, my company makes a substantial amount of money. And at some point the government, you know, gave us sixty thousand dollars. And I'm like, you know, I said to my I, I remember saying to one of my buddies who runs a business. Who his he has a trucking company that makes about a truck repair company and he makes you know grosses well over five million dollars a year and they gave him sixty thousand dollars. He's we're looking at each other and we're going to go and what are we supposed to do with this? <laughs> you know? Well, here's one for you, Lionel. <clears throat> we kept getting an email from the state saying, "Hey, you're eligible for relief funds." And I got like three or four emails and and I went to our accountant and I'm like. And we're we're holding our own. We haven't really been closed. If people need this money, let them take it. And the accountant says, well, apply for it. And if they don't think you should get it, they won't give it to you. All right. And I'm like, all right. So I fill it out and they send me this big congratulatory email that they're going to send us money. And they sent us $2,000. <laughs> and I'm like, I literally said, hey, keep it. Give it to somebody <laughs> who needs $2,000 because $2,000 won't run our business for an hour. Yeah. Yeah, and then you with, know? yeah, and with containers costing twenty two thousand bucks, and I mean, do you, so uh, just briefly, and I see I've dragged this on and on, but uh, just briefly, do you have a company like that handles your logistics? Do you have like a a, a, a company that you deal with that that, that handles all <laughs> yeah, that? Or so, you, are you doing that in house or? That's a good. That's another good story. So back in May, so right after Chinese New Year, we we had a company that was courting us for our business for. Um, freight forwarder. And uh, so we decide we're going to move from the freight forwarder we've had since the beginning and we're going to try this company. And and uh, we get our first, we go to book our first container and that's when the world fell apart on international shipping. And they went, look, they said to us, literally said this, you're a new customer, we can't help you. And it's like, you courted our business. And, and they're like, sorry. So thankfully we hadn't fired our original freight forwarder. And uh, we went back to them and not, they didn't know we were mo- going to move the business. And, and so they book us a container and uh, they come back to us and they're like, well, you got bumped, which happens that you get bumped off. But they're like, Home Depot came to us. They've got 1,500 containers ready to part China and they're going to pay us $25,000 a container. <laughs> they're like, you're off. And I'm like, I don't blame them. I understand. And so we actually went to our factory and it's like, we're dying here. We can't find a freight forwarder here in the U.S. that will give us a container. And uh, our factory actually found a freight forwarder in Shenzhen, China. And uh, we've been working with this forwarder. They have a subsidiary in L.A. And we've been working with them since May. And and they've got us a container every time. We're paying through the nose for it. Um, And the other challenge has been normally we come through Panama Canal, but a lot of stuff has been coming through the Suez, which adds a couple of more weeks to the transit time. But, you know, but we're getting containers. And that's the key. I'd much rather have a, a... a container on a boat moving our way. I've heard some horror stories from some manufacturers in our industry who've had to wait two and three months just to get on a boat. Yeah. I mean, and this is something like, you know, you think about seven, eight years ago when you started the company and now here you are taught, we're talking stories about containers. You probably know more about containers and shipping than you ever thought you'd know. Oh my goodness. I had no clue seven <laughs> years ago, but I've learned a lot since. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and I said this many times, you know, Mike, Joe, Paul and I, when we started the company, we had 130 years of combined experience in the hobby and in the industry. And you would think with that much experience, you'd at least have an inkling of a clue of what to do in a, in a model train business. And I'll be the first to admit we had no freaking idea. <laughs> <laughs> we have learned so much in the last seven years and, and learn every day, and which is cool, right? I mean, oh, learning yeah. means you're growing. Absolutely. It's like I had uh, somebody called me up uh, going up but we were about uh 
six months into the pandemic and they were upset because they weren't getting their product and they were going up one side of me and down the other. And I mean, then they got, they got pretty aggressive. And finally I said to them, sir, I gotta be honest. They actually said, don't you, didn't you have some sort of plan for, didn't you plan for something like this? And I finally, I said, <laughs> finally, I said, you know what? I, I actually said it to the guy this way. I said, you know what, buddy? This is my first worldwide pandemic. So, no, I didn't have any kind of a contingency plan in place. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, who, who would have thought, right? Yeah. And the problem is you, you, you almost can't blame even customers that will call up and be aggressive. You almost can't blame them because they're unbelievably frustrated for, for because everybody's dealing with something they've never had yep. to deal with before. So even people that are aggressive, you're kind of feeling like you, you don't want to take it, but you kind of feel sorry for them because they're as frustrated as they can possibly be. Yep. You know, everybody's just struggling. To, you know, it's like, well, well, the line always I always use that I tell people when they're really frustrated, I'm like, no one wants to ship a product more than us. And the reason I say that is if we're not shipping product, we're not making money. Yeah. And if we're not making money, we're not paying our bills. We're not paying our people. We're not investing in the future so nobody wants to ship a product more than we do exactly and you think you got problems this podcast is heard all around the world on every continent on the planet and trying to get a container to ship this podcast from <laughs> <laughs> from los angeles to australia is almost impossible uh because i i surely we can get the podcast in those 20 foot containers but still you know um <laughs> i'll be all here i'll be here all week folks try the veal uh, all right, that's it. So, uh, Shane, if you ever want to email us, you just uh, write to modelerslife at gmail dot com. That's modelers with one L, like Wilson, not two L's, like uh, Lionel. And uh, nicely done. Yeah, and uh, we have a website, amodelerslife dot com. And if you go there, it tells you all about the podcast. You can click on a picture of the Bruce, the moderately agitated male boy, in a particularly <laughs> agitated state. And uh, boom, you just click on that picture and you, you automatically, uh, email pops up and all you got to do is fill in the text. And we love getting email, whether pro or con. And uh, we have a website. We're at the web. And if you want merchandise, Shane, I'm sure you lo- you don't look like a t-shirt kind of guy to me. Do you wear t-shirts? Nah, I'm more of a polo kind of guy. Yeah, that's what I think too. I should get some polo shirts. But anyways, uh, if you ever want uh, a t-shirt, you just go to Midwest Model Railroad in there in Independence, Missouri, and their URL is uh, MidwestModelRR.com. Scroll across the navigation bar, click on AML, and boom, there you go. You can buy, a, you go into a wonderland of AML merchandise, hats, hoodies, t-shirts, mugs, whatever you could possibly need. And with that, I think we're done. I think, would you mind terribly if I may put this on a Monday? Like if I broadcast this on Monday, January the 10th. Works for me. All right. Uh, so we're, because it's going to be an actual show uh, rather than just an add-on, you have to, at the very end, you're going to have to follow along here and, and help me out. I okay. Think. All right. So so just whatever pops into your head. It's not a trick question. Oh, this is going to be tough. Yeah, it is. Uh, So remember, remember, a Modeler's Life podcast is considered marginally adequate by six out of ten Santa (laughs) Clauses. For car crushing action Saturday, Saturday, Saturday at the Spectrum Burning Motor Coaches Battle It Out in the Mud Bog with special guest stars Heather Locklear and Knight Rider Car Kit. It's another Lincoln Homer.